Christmas is a holiday for children. It is not a holiday for adults. Like, like you know, I think that. I really, wow. <laughs> I don't know. We're having Grinch on as the person of the it's week. It's true. It's true. I think Christmas is a holiday for children. Like, I think it's weird to get adults Christmas gifts. But <laughs> don't say Merry Christmas if you're over the age of 21. Here's the thing. I love, I love Christmas decorations. I love the time of year. I love it. I just think that, you know, I think adults, it's like after 21, it's like, come on, man, what are you doing? That's Cord Jefferson, who, despite his potentially unpopular opinions about Christmas, is a unique cultural force. For over a decade, wherever the culture's gone, that's where he's been. During the heyday of digital media, Jefferson was a star blogger at the now defunct Gawker. Then he turned to Hollywood and worked on some of the top shows of the golden age of television, like Succession, The Good Place, Master of None, and Watchmen. And his writing on Watchmen won him an Emmy in 2020. Now, Jefferson's making his directorial debut with his biggest and most ambitious project yet. His new movie, American Fiction, which he wrote and directed, is a sharp publishing satire about Black fiction, white guilt, and the way racial trauma has been commodified. American Fiction stars Jeffrey Wright, Sterling K. Brown, Issa Rae, and Tracy Ellis Ross and hits theaters in December. Now, you could love this movie for the incredible cast alone, but honestly, I loved everything about this film. It's everything a movie should be. It will make you laugh. It will make you think. It will make you see the world just a little bit differently. American Fiction won the People's Choice Award at the Toronto International Film Festival in September, and Jefferson is already the subject of some serious Oscar buzz. I'm Charlotte Alter, senior correspondent for Time, and this is Person of the Week. I was telling them, I was like, I know Charlotte, go back. (laughs) Your baby's like the cutest baby in the world. It's kind of, it's kind of unbelievable. Uh, Thank you so much. People told you that before. You know, they have. She is like kind of insanely cute. It's strange. She's, it is strange. It is really weird to have (laughs) a supermodel baby. (laughs) And like, I could be like, no, she's not. There's cuter babies, but like. No, you're yeah, right. It's insane. She is the cutest one. <laughs> like, um, okay, so uh, here on this show, we like to start at the very beginning. Yeah. So, can you tell me about growing up in Tucson? Like, what was your family like? What were your mom and dad like? Yeah, yeah. I would say that I had a weird upbringing, sort of like mm-hmm. normal in most of the normal ways. You know, I, my dad's a lawyer. My mother was an educator. <sighs> She started out as a third grade teacher, but by the time I was around, she was an administrator. But it was weird in that my dad is a black Republican and my mother was Mm. a white liberal. And so nothing was taken for granted in my household. There was constant debate and dissection of sort of like belief systems. There was a lot of back and forth and argument and sort of gentle teasing. It was sort of like a strange stew as far as that went socially in my house. So Republican and Democrat. Yeah, yeah. You don't hear about that too much these days. What was that like? I mean, it was interesting. I think that it was good. It's very foundational for me in a way that I think it's very important with sort of like the the way that the world is polarized these days. It was a very helpful upbringing that it helped me realize that not all Republicans are uh, racist maniacs and not all Democrats, you know, are sort of like uh, bleeding heart liberals who— are illogical, I would say, and sort of like put their feelings and their emotions before any sense of reason. I just, I don't think I'm a centrist. I think that I'm pretty far left, but I do have this sort of very good understanding very early on that, you know, people can have differences of opinion without being like monsters, you know. Right. My father is a Republican, but he didn't vote for Donald Trump. He would never vote for Donald Trump. He considers himself more libertarian than mm-hmm. Republican these days. He says that sometimes he's embarrassed to call himself a Republican anymore. But he, you know, he was a Goldwater Republican, we'll say, mm. in that way. I read somewhere that your mother's family was very unhappy when she married your father. Yeah. So my mother was disowned by her family when she married my father. The famous story is that she and my dad started dating right before— Christmas, and her parents said, uh, we never want to speak to you ever again. 
And my mom sort of thought like, sure, yeah, okay, never. And so she went out and bought a bunch of Christmas gifts for her parents and her brother and her siblings and, and left them on the front door at their home. And by the time she'd gotten back to her house, she went out to run more errands. All of the gifts were sort of at her front doorstep. And there was a note that said, when we said never, we meant never. Oh, my God. And so she didn't end up talking to her father again until he was on his deathbed. I would send letters to my grandfather until I was about eight or nine, and he would send them back unopened. Uh, my mother would send letters pretty consistently um, for for a long time. But those ones never came back, and there's like a very dark uh, kind of like cinematic story where my mother's brother, who she eventually had a reconciliation with her brother before she passed, but... My mother's brother said that one day he walked into their dad's room and her dad was just sitting there reading this box of her letters that he had accumulated wow. over the years. And, you know, clearly he was like torn up about all of this. Anyway, all that's to say that, you know, again, the thing that I learned from that, that is sort of like a foundational experience for me was that my mother used to tell me all the time, she'd say, I try to think of something that you could do that would make me stop talking to you and mm -hmm. stop loving you. And she was like, I've thought of you murdering people and sort of like doing the worst things that a person could do. And even that, I can't envision a world in which I would stop loving you and not want to speak to you. So I had from a very early age, just this idea of like race is ridiculous and mm. sort of like pointless. And that this being anything worth caring about is just a ridiculous notion. And mm. so I had that very basic understanding very early on that all of this is like an absurd societal creation as opposed to something concrete and important. Wow. So when did you first start thinking about becoming a writer? My parents were professionals and they'd both been to grad school and their friends were professionals. So I didn't really know anybody who made money from art, who was creative for a living. I knew people who like played in bar bands on the weekends and I knew people who like wrote as a hobby. But as far as being an artist as a profession, I didn't, that seemed out of reach to me. Mm. You know, I thought that that was something that people in New York and LA and Paris did. You know, I was from Tucson, Arizona and come from like money or anything. So I always assumed that one day I would go to law school and then I would just sort of like write on the side as a hobby. So um, I knew that I was into writing. I was on the high school newspaper and then I founded this literary magazine in college and so I always knew that I really enjoyed it. But again, it seemed like, who am I to mm -hmm. say that I'm a writer? You know, who am I to pursue this professionally? And so uh, one of the ways that I scratched that creative itch was I started at a day job. I was a communications coordinator at this small nonprofit in Venice Beach right after college. And on the weekends, I would write as a hobby. And then one day I met this guy who was an editor at this music magazine in L.A. called Filter. And he asked me to start writing for him. And so I started writing for him a little bit. And then I just started getting a bunch of different freelance journalism jobs. And it scratched that itch of allowing me to write and be creative, but in a way that my parents understood and the way that my parents could say like, oh, he's a journalist. There's one foot in the professional world and one foot in the creative world. And so I was a journalist for about eight or nine years in various capacities, always with an eye toward like, well, I wonder what I could do beyond this. You know, I came up during the 2008 to 2014 kind of like... Gawker era. Gawker, but also like essayistic writing and sort of like that was my window in journalism. I was always interested in film and TV, but there's just so many barriers and obstacles to getting into it. It feels like these like insurmountable walls yeah. like if you don't know anybody who works in the industry. So... I just assumed that I would just be like a guy who writes for the internet for the rest of my life. So my last two years in journalism were spent at Gawker from 2012 to 2014. And so not only was I working with people that I really loved, whose work I respected, and who I was just a fan of as a reader, let alone a colleague. Beyond that, it was just I had a lot of freedom. But it was great because I came in and... I asked uh, my boss, I said, look, I, I want to work here. I really love the work you guys do, but I don't want to just blog. I don't want to yeah. just do daily small stuff. And so we had an understanding that I could essentially take my time and just write longer things, write essays. It was less of just like the day-to-day -day grind of just mm -hmm. blogging. My first day there, nobody told me what to do. Like, that's it. And right. they were just like, go. I was like, well, what do I write? And they were like, whatever you want. 
in many ways, it's like one of the best jobs, if not the best job that I ever had. That amount of freedom. Like, I love working in film and television, but there's so many layers of bureaucracy and sort of like people telling you what you can and can't do. It's just, you know, just the distance between an idea that you had and sort of the execution of that idea was a very short distance. Right. And now, you know, many of the ideas that I have between my mind and the execution is like Mm. a very, very long distance, you know? So what made you think it's time to move on if you were sort of having so much fun at this job? What made you think, you know what, I'm going to actually do a total pivot to an entirely new industry? Uh, Just the luck of the draw. So I had done a satirical thing for Gawker about a surf competition in Huntington Beach, I believe. And after the surf competition, um, all of these kids who had been at the tournament destroyed Huntington Beach. They, like, smashed out windows of the town. They were, like, getting in fights in the street, overturning porta potties Like, they were just laying waste to this town. And, you know, it was surf teenagers. It was predominantly, like, a white crowd. And so I wrote this quick essay for Gawker about, you know, the white youth are out of control. Like, where are the white parents? Sort of like, you know, it's because they're listening to this anti-authoritarian punk rock music that's telling them, like, you don't have to listen to adults and rules. And, you know, it was essentially just the thing that Bill O'Reilly would say if these were black teenagers doing the exact same thing, you know. And the next day, Chris Hayes had me on MSNBC to do, like, a satirical hit, basically, where we talked like Fox News hosts. And that kind of took off in a way that I was not expecting it to take off. And so, eventually, that clip, a few weeks later, found its way toward this showrunner named Mike O'Malley. He's an actor and a writer. And he was just about to start a show called Survivor's Remorse, which was based loosely on LeBron James's life. And he reached out to me and said, have you ever thought about writing for TV? He said, I think that this is funny, and I think that you'd be a good staff writer. So he just asked me to come work in that room. And, you know, I hesitated at first. I had to quit my job at Gawker to do it. And they uh, only guaranteed employment for 13 weeks. So I wasn't sure that I was going to do it. But I always tell people... And I truly believe this, that like a storyteller is a storyteller. Yes, it is different as far as format goes and the technical aspects of it. But to sit down and write an interesting article, you need to be able to bring readers from the beginning to the end in an engaging way. And you need to sort of have interesting characters who say interesting things and sort of like all of the things that you're doing in that article to make it appealing for a reader is the stuff that you do in a script. So at the last minute, I pulled the trigger and decided, you know, let's try it. If Mm -hmm. I like it, I like it. And if I don't, like, Gawker will always be there. (laughs) You know what's stable? Internet journalism. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. This isn't going anywhere. When we come back, Cord Jefferson talks about his directorial debut, American Fiction. More in a minute. So I read an interview where you said that sort of towards the end of your time at Gawker, you found that you were sort of like pulled into this kind of racial trauma beat almost. Mm -hmm. And that like you found yourself writing constantly about like bad things that were happening to black people. How did that contribute to your decision to kind of try something else? So it was partially my own doing, right? Like I wrote this article called The Racism Beat in 2014 right after I left to work in TV. And part of that is about how, you know, when you're young and you're just starting out in your career, you're trying to figure out what can you do that other people cannot do? How do you distinguish yourself from sort of like the pack of writers, especially the pack of other writers on the internet? And, you know, one of the things that distinguished me was that I was black. You know, I would write often about race and the intersection of race and culture and the intersection of race and politics. That was something that I had taken upon myself to do. I did not sort of realize it would eventually sort of just snowball to this place that that was kind of the only thing that people really Mm -hmm. wanted me to do. It became like, oh, you like to write about race? Well, then why don't you write about Trayvon Martin getting killed? Why don't you write about Mike Brown getting killed? And it just felt like, oh, 
we're not thinking about race in these interesting ways and, and discussing mm-hmm. the ways that it that permeates culture and permeates entertainment and stuff. It's just sort of like very didactic. Like, do you want to write an essay about how it's wrong that another black person was killed? And it's like, well, that's like a two sentence essay. You like know racism what I mean? Bad. Yes, exactly. Like, what yeah. do you want me to say? And so it just became like this revolving door of trauma and pain and agony that I was like, this is no longer interesting to me. Not only is it no longer interesting to me, it's like actively painful to like wake up every day and feel like, oh, this is my job is just to write about these sort of like agony of human beings. So by the time that Mike reached out to me to ask me to work on the TV show, I was already feeling that I kind of had reached this wall in the stuff that I wanted to write about. So it just felt like time to try a new thing and sort of see what happens with that. So, you know, you've just directed your debut film, American Fiction, which won the Toronto International Film Festival's People's Choice Award and is going to be released on December 15th. Mm-hmm. I loved this movie. Thank you. So can you tell our listeners what the movie's I can about? Try the elevator pitch is that Jeffrey Wright plays an author named Monk who specializes in kind of contemporary retellings of classical Greek mythology in his novels. And his novels are respected by certain people, but not very well read. And he's certainly not making a ton of money from his writing. He's also a college professor. And one of the failings of his books is that people say they're not black enough. Monk is a black writer, and people say, like, you don't write black enough books. And so one day, as a sort of, like, angry reaction to that criticism, he writes this quote-unquote black book that kind of has every stereotype in the world about the black community. And he writes it intending to humiliate the publishers and sort of like rub their noses in the garbage that they ask black writers to write. And it ends up becoming this massive success, this runaway bestseller hit. And he was not prepared for that. And so his life is forever altered by the success of this prank that he was intending to pull off. So there is so much here. (laughs) First of all, (laughs) this movie is based on this book, uh, Erasure by Percival Everett, which came out in 2001. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I wanted to ask you is this novel Erasure was not like a bestseller, wasn't really on anybody's radar. Yeah. What spoke to you about this book and why did you feel like it was so relevant for 2023? It came out in 2001. Uh, I had never heard of it until December of 2020. I was reading a review for another book called Interior Chinatown. Mm -hmm. And the uh, reviewer said that that book had a satire reminiscent of Percival Everett's Erasure. And Mm. so I went and read about Erasure. It sounded interesting to me. And I went and bought a copy right before the holiday break. And I just devoured it. And I just kept thinking about it. And there wasn't just the themes of what it means to be a black writer, the restrictions that people place on on what you can and can't write about. There was also a lot of overlaps with my personal life. There was a character Monk has two siblings that he's sometimes close to and sometimes distant from. And I have two older siblings and we've gone through push and pull in our relationships. There's an overbearing father figure who looms large in the novel. And I have an overbearing father who looms large in my and my brother's lives. And there's an ailing mother. And I moved home eight years ago to take care of my ailing mother. So there was all these just weird overlaps with my life, personal and professional. Mm -hmm. A lot of strange coincidences that I was like, oh, this also bears resemblance to my life. Oh, and this bears resemblance to my life. And then this bears resemblance to my life. It it just started becoming too much to ignore as far as like, oh, this feels like it was written for me. And so I think within 50 pages, I knew that I wanted to adapt it and possibly direct it. I started reading the book in Jeffrey Wright's voice. That's how early I wanted Jeffrey on the project was I started picturing the character of Monk as Jeffrey Wright. And as soon as I was done with it, I reached out to Percival to ask him for the rights. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the reasons that both the book and the movie are so relevant is that it's really about all of these sort of contradictions about how Black storytelling is commodified and received, especially by white gatekeepers. Yes, and I would say that it also, to me, it's expansive in that I think that it's about the ways in which there are rigid limitations about the kinds of stories that certain people are allowed to tell. And so this story specifically, obviously Jeffrey Wright's black, the actors in the movie are black, but 
you know, I have Mexican friends who are like, why does every story about Mexico have to be about drug cartels and mm-hmm. like some poor person fleeing like their miserable circumstances in their small Mexican town to like get to the right. promised land that is the United States. I think that there's a lot of people who just feel that the sort of expansiveness of their lives is not really captured in mm. pop culture in the way that other people's lives are captured in pop culture. And so I think it's just really about how a lot of artists and writers and creatives feel pigeonholed by, as you said, the sort of like gatekeepers atop these institutions that are making TV and film and books and other culture. Yeah. And there's this cluelessness with which the industry treats this story, which is where a lot of the humor comes from. How much of that kind of humor was drawn from your own experience? Oh, so much, so much, a lot of it. You know, I've had uh, notes come back to me about characters asking the characters to be blacker from uh, from executives that say, like, you need to make this character more black. And when I get that note, I say, like, I'll indulge that note if they get me on the phone and tell me what they think blacker is. Like, how do I make a character blacker? I want to hear it from them. And then, of course, that note goes away because everybody's terrified to sort of try to explain how to make a character blacker because right. they know that they'd sound like idiots. Like, I've had a executive call me a mulatto to my face. Oh my I've God. had somebody say, like, you're a mulatto, right? And this is, like, within the past, you know, 10 years. This is not, like— 30, 40, 50 years ago. And look, I'm not saying that these people are malicious, but, you know, I just think that a lot of the times people, you know, they don't know. They're ignorant. I heard this great thing called Hanlon's Razor, and I think about it all the time now. Hmm. You know, Occam's Razor? Yeah. Hanlon's Razor says, never ascribe to malice what could more accurately be ascribed to ignorance. Or and stupidity. I, yeah, exactly. That is sort of like a very real thing that I think hmm. about now is that People aren't necessarily malicious. The vast majority of people aren't saying, like, I'm going to say a racist thing now. I think that a lot of people, their hearts are in the right place, and they sort of are ignorant. They don't know what to say and what not to say. And so, like the people in this film, I think that these aren't people who are, like, burning crosses and stuff. They're people who just who just don't know any better, you know? So one of the things about this is that there has been this ongoing conversation about the best way to tell more Black stories and to elevate more Black storytellers. And this movie is about, in some ways, all the ways these white gatekeepers are still getting that wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that this movie asks is something that I've asked for a long time, which is, why is it always these stories when it comes to sort of like the quote-unquote prestigious films and television shows, right? Like, why is it always slavery? Why is it always a civil rights activist who needs to overcome, you know, white racists who are blocking black students from getting to the school or dumping food on their head. Why is it always people who are in gangs? Why is it always people who are drug dealers? Why is it always a black person being killed by the police? Like, I'm not saying that these movies shouldn't be made. In fact, I think that we live in a country now in which people are actively trying to rewrite history and actively trying to cut out these kinds of lessons from school and they're actively banning books about queer people and black people and and slavery. And like, I understand that we are sort of opposing these kinds of people who want to get rid of these stories. And so these stories aren't just real. They're also important to have and remind people of. That being said, I think the bigger and more important question is why are we making all of these stories to the exclusion of all other kinds Mm -hmm. of stories, you know? to the exclusion of every other thing that has sort of, like, happened in black life. Like, nowadays in the United States of America, black life includes slavery, of course, but it also includes the president of the United States, you know, and everything in between that. I mean, there is such a limited perspective in Hollywood and in other places where black stories get told of black life. So I think that, to me, that's just sort of, like, a much more important question. I don't really care why artists make the art that they make. Well, I do care, but I think that artists make art within systems and institutions that were created long before they were around. And so far be it for me to criticize another artist's art because they're Mm -hmm. simply working within the institutions that were made by people who are like 10 levels above. And so the question to me is why are those people so interested in telling the same stories over and over and over and over again? Mm -hmm. Why are those people interested in this very limited perspective on what it means to be a black person or a Mexican person or any other group of person that they're telling stories about. 
why do they have such a poverty of imagination when it comes to what other people's lives look like? Hmm. You know? So, so much of your work has this like really sharp element of cultural critique. I'm curious, you know, when you're working, which comes first, the idea or the story? Do you say, oh, I want to tell this incredible story and actually it's really relevant right now because these themes emerge? Or do you think to yourself, I want to talk about this idea and here is a story that could be a good vehicle for unpacking that? I think probably the story always comes first because to me, there's no way that that stuff isn't going to creep in. And so it's impossible for me to make something that isn't a little sharp and a little acerbic Mm -hmm. because I think that I do have this like deep well of anger. I think that a lot of journalists do. You know, I think that that's sort of like what guides a lot of journalists in the first place is just Hmm. sort of an anger about the things that they see around them and the problems that they see in the world that nobody's really thinking about and caring about. I think that sort of anger really does drive a lot, at least the journalists that I've known. And so that's always going to be part of the work. There's always going to be criticisms and, and some cynicism and some satire in the work that I do, no matter what. You know, I also really want to, especially these days, like move away from sort of like mm-hmm. telling people, here's what you think. Like I did the op-ed thing. I did persuasive writing. I've done that. And I don't really want to do that anymore. And I think that if I was led by the idea that here's the message I want to get across, I just think that it just becomes too on the nose, you know? I think that, you know, some people want to do that and more power to them. But one of the really important things for me about this movie was that it not feel like it's spoon-feeding morality and spoon-feeding lessons to people. It's just I'm putting forth a series of scenes and characters and letting you make your own judgment about what you've just seen. Okay, this has been such an incredible conversation about creativity and authorship and how you're shaping Hollywood and storytelling. But now I'd just like to turn to a couple of the little things that shape you. Yes. In a segment that we like to end with that's called The Last Time. Okay. When's the last time you went to the beach? Oh, uh, uh, probably like two years. Okay. I live in LA. I live on the east side, though. I'm like a Silver Lake Echo Park okay. guy. So the beach it might is, as well not even exactly. be. Exactly. The beach is like, you're talking like an hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. When's the last time you experienced heartbreak, big or small? Ooh, uh, probably three years. Okay. When's the last time you heard somebody with a beautiful voice? Ooh, uh, two days ago. Who was it? It was uh, my friend, Clay. Yeah, he's got a very sonorous voice. Clay, if you're listening, yeah. congrats. <laughs> um, when's the last time you ate something delicious? Uh, last night. And what was it? Uh, it was a bunch of gummy bears. Gummy bears are the best candy. Wow. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. When's the last time you were stuck in traffic? Uh, three days ago, but it was in Atlanta, of all places, not Los Angeles. Atlanta has horrible traffic. I hated it. Cord, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. This was so fun. Such a pleasure. You can catch Cord Jefferson's new film, American Fiction, in theaters starting December 15th. Thank you so much for listening to Person of the Week. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd really love to hear from you. So send your tips and thoughts on our show to personoftheweek at time.com. I'm Charlotte Alter. See you next week. Person of the Week is hosted by Charlotte Alter. It's produced by Nina Bisbano and India Witkin. Our senior producer is Ursula Summer. Our story editor is Katie Feather. This episode was mixed by Rebecca Seidel. Our theme music was composed by Billy Libby. Joseph Frischmuth is our fact checker. Person of the Week is a co-production of Time Studios and Sugar 23. At Time, our executive producers are Michael Erlinger and Sam Jacobs. At Sugar 23, our executive producers are Mike Mayer, Michael Sugar, and Liam Billingham. Sasha Mathias is the head of audio at Time. You can find us online at time.com slash person of the week and wherever you get your podcasts.